Edward O. Wilson's life in science began when he was just a boy exploring the wilderness of Alabama and northern Florida. That childhood passion has led to an esteemed career as a scientist, professor, and author. He is responsible for such groundbreaking ideas as biogeography, sociobiology, biophilia, and consilience. He has received two Pulitzer Prizes for his books on human nature and the ants, as well as the National Medal of Science. In his latest book, The Future of Life, he argues that we are in danger of losing half of the Earth's species and plants by the end of the century. I am pleased to have him here to talk about these ideas and more. Welcome. Thank you, Charlie. Good to see you again. I'm glad to be back. Yeah. What's the, I mean, one thing that's happened to you, which I want to talk about mm -hmm. first, um, you had, for the lack of a better word, a Walden experience. Yes. I deliberately acquired a Walden experience because in preparing this book, which is a kind of a brief from the conservation and biology front about uh, the world's fauna and flora, right. how much there is, what's happening to it, what can we do to save it, uh, I wanted to provide historical depth. And uh, Henry David Thoreau is uh, very much the progenitor of the American environmental ethic. So, uh, I immersed myself in Thoreau, Vienna, and uh, introduced the whole subject by a letter to this gentleman. Which begins the book, that's right. That's right. right. The, but, uh, but you also went to Walden Park. Oh, I stayed out a lot of times. And, yeah. and uh, what did it do and tell you, and what did you feel? I, uh, I was reading uh, what he said about that particular place, what he said about his feelings concerning nature, uh, why he went there, and so on. And uh, that gave me the uh, perspective of another thinker across 150 years. And uh, so I was able to point out to Mr. Thoreau and to you, the reader, uh, similarities in the way we think about the environment today and uh, the way he thought about it long ago, and thus to put into a better uh, perspective uh, why the American environment movement is the way it is today. Uh, how bad are things? Uh, pretty bad. Uh, that's uh, why I, I, I feel a sense of urgency in getting this whole issue on to center stage in the media and public domain. Uh, on the one hand, scientists are discovering more and more diversity as they explore the planet. And they're finding we, that we only know a small fraction of what's out there, but of the organisms we know best, you know, like the flowering plants and right. vertebrates, birds, mammals, and so on, they're disappearing faster and faster. They're disappearing at a rate of about one-tenth of a percent of the species per year, and that is clearly picking up. So much so, due to destruction of habitats and uh, the flood of uh, alien species, you know, invading species. Mm. Uh, from uh, different parts of the world into each country in turn, uh, that uh, it, it's entirely possible that uh, if there's no abatement in the ill effects of these human activities, we could lose half the species of plants and animals within the century. What's the worst villain in what we are doing to the ecosystem? Habitat destruction. Uh, the cutting of the old growth forest, and especially the tropical rainforest, destruction of the coral reefs, and other natural environments uh, everywhere in the world, from the Arctic down, but particularly in the tropical regions where the developing countries containing 80% of the people on Earth are still expanding their populations and increasing their per capita consumption and moving ahead with very little concern for the ultimate fate of the, uh, of the natural environments that they, uh, that they are responsible for. You argue here that essentially there is a consensus in the scientific community about the peril. Yes. Yet when you come to something like ANWR and oil drilling, which is invasion of habitat, you find serious disagreement, not just among politicians, because politicians call scientists to order to mm. testify on their behalf. Serious disagreement on political leaders, among political leaders and public philosophers who don't know the subject. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, not among scientists, where this is a virtual unanimity about the size of the problem. Uh, size I, of the problem, but... but, but the, yeah, and, and the consequences of it. 
which means as the number of, of species go down, we know from uh, careful field studies now, place by place around the world, you lose stability, you lose environmental security. Uh, these natural systems that our lives depend on uh, are, I uh, find it more and more difficult to recover from shocks like fire or drought. And we also uh, find that uh, the productivity of them goes down and a great many of the services that they have provided us for free, one estimate has it 33 trillion a year, mm. free of charge. Those services are just eroding away underneath our feet. Is there, let me stay with science, no disagreement at all you're suggesting? Virtually none. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, Virtually none on the nature of the pearl or in terms of the degree? The, uh, either, either on the, uh, on the extinction, effect cause extinction, or effect. yeah, on the extinction uh, that's occurring, on the rate at which it's occurring, and on the ultimate effects of its continuing to occur, there's virtually no disagreement among the scientists who study the problems of, uh, of biological diversity of this planet. Draw me the worst scenario of the consequences of no change in direction. Worst scenario, which shall we say would be here within the century, uh, would include uh, the Amazon and other great forest, tropical forest wilderness of the world right. gone. The Amazon in particular. Gone means what? Gone. Cut. Means there's no longer. Cut, uh, covered by uh, scrub, uh, by uh, agricultural lands, which uh, probably would be rather low in productivity. Coral reefs around the world largely gone uh, and uh, the world a far lonelier place a far less interesting place but also climatically less stable uh, much more liable to uh, uh, swift and unpleasant changes uh, in uh, local environment and then on around the world in global environment uh, human population waking up to the fact that it has destroyed half the creation, uh, uh, consisting of, of uh, millions of species, which in turn average uh, a million years or so in longevity before they go extinct naturally, now have been wiped out a thousand times faster mm. than that. You know what's amazing about this process, is, and, and this is in here, half of the species, or whatever the number is, we don't know, we've never even identified them. That's right. There's an extraordinary yeah. amount of life on this planet. This is still a little known planet. Yeah. And one of the great tasks of biology of the 21st century is going to be to finish the exploration of that uh, biological diversity and uh, have as part of that effort, uh, the, the effort to save it. We do have some good ideas about how to save it. Let yeah, me and add that's where, and, and, that, and wh what you're trying to do in this book is in a exactly. sense say, for God's sakes, let's use these ideas. Exactly. Here's what. Here's here's a situation, year 2002. Uh, we're beginning to get an idea of how little we know of the biological diversity and how much we work we have to put in in order to really get this planet explored, mapped, in a way that we can sustain uh, the rest of life on Earth. We have a grip on the problem. We know how fast the species are disappearing, and we know where and why they're disappearing to some extent. We need a lot more information at the beginning to get a grip on it. And we know what to do to save them. And uh, the uh, measures that can be taken to save them include uh, putting an umbrella as quickly as possible over the critical areas where the largest number of species are endangered in uh, that are concentrated in a relatively small number of areas called hotspots. Yeah, I was going to say that. You talk okay. about hotspots. Go right, ahead. Right, right. Give so, me the sense of here we are now in the arena of solutions exactly. to save the planet. That's exactly right, and that's what's important. Let's okay. get moving. Let's get on okay. it. Okay, but, but give us the reason yeah. how, why you believe it can be saved and what measures must be taken and where the economic resources come from to ensure that survival. Let me give it in a nutshell then. Uh, the 25 most important hotspots where the largest number of endangered species occur, as for example in places like the Philippines, mm. Madagascar, the rainforest of Hawaii, cover rainforest only... Rainforest everywhere. Yeah, well, rainforest everywhere, but there are some that are more critically right. endangered than others. 
cover 1.4 percent of the uh, of the Earth's land surface. That 1.4 percent contains something like 44 percent of the kinds of plants found nowhere else, and 35 percent of the vertebrate animals, you know, birds, reptiles, mammals. Uh, add to that now the core tropical wilderness areas of the Amazon, the Congo, and New Guinea. They can be secured as primary reserves uh, with one payment, according to a study made by biologists and econ economists a year and a half ago, one payment of $28 billion. If it goes along with the right kind of economic development of the areas around the hotspot and the tropical wilderness area, a big first step that will cover a majority of the species of plants and animals on Earth. $28 billion in one payment. Can that be done? Can we raise, can the world as a whole raise $28 billion? Yes, that's one-tenth of one percent yeah, of but the but gross but world product. Of course it is, but let me just tell you that the Secretary General of the United States just you know, is, is going around the world and making speeches about how much billion, how many billions he needs for poverty in the world. I mean, yes. There is a sense of the world trying to uh, a, deal with its own economic yeah. recovery, first of all, deal with war and famine, and at the same time saying we've got poverty on an alarming scale between have and have nots. Yes. And here comes E.O. Wilson saying, well, here's another issue that's going to destroy the planet. How do you break through? Uh, you see, you've just touched the key point. Uh, the one thing that the biologists and economists have uh, come, one major conclusion they've come to, and it's, it's a dominant theme now of the global conservation organizations and the movement as a whole, is that we cannot save this disappearing life, especially in the developing countries, without bringing up the economies right, of the right, developing right. countries to a decent level. Economy, economic development of these countries that so concern us now, Africa, tropical Asia, around the world, economic development is interlocked with the conservation of their natural resources and the better yeah. and more productive use of, of their natural sources. So out of economic, so that somebody, either because of greed, family, are not making economic choices that they see no option that destroy the environment. We have methods and they've been put in, they're being put into pilot studies now to show that, uh, they're, uh, that uh, uh, many of these countries in the areas where the biological diversity is the most critical and where the people are the poorest right. can make more money quickly on a short-term basis by turning their forests, their coral reefs, their other uh, wild environments that they have left uh, into new uses, developing new markets and encouraging the input of aid from organizations like the World Bank uh, to achieve both economic development and conservation of natural resources simultaneously. This is achievable and uh, it is the way to go. This really ought to be, in fact, part of the American foreign policy, is a combination of improving uh, the, uh, the economies of the developing nations and the quality of life to a decent level at the same time that we're, we're helping them out with new uh, economic resources based on, which, on what they, are, they have in the greatest richness yeah. of in all. A, in an interesting way, AIDS uh, in the last couple of years and, and the terrible and horrendous destruction of life in Africa, say, has been defined as a national security issue yes. for the United States. And you wouldn't want to argue that the peril of the environment is a national security issue for the United States. Exactly. It is a security issue, and it ought to be considered as part of the armamentarium of American foreign policy. But it has not been, not no. by the Clinton administration, not by the no. Bush administration. And I don't know if someone would come to me and say, who is, you know, the most vocal in the bully pulpit of arguing for the future of the planet? Mm -hmm. I know there are lots of voices. You bring scholarship and, and the ability of a writer and an activist, mm -hmm. but who, how do you put it on that agenda? How do you put it at the forefront of a national agenda? 
uh, or international agenda, because well, it I, takes all those nations working together. Well, precisely what I've been trying to do, and others uh, have, uh, you know, are coming from the ranks of the scientists and, and, uh, and, and, and environmental economists, uh, is to recruit a, a, a sufficient cadre of scholars, advisors, public philosophers, and commentators to understand what is at stake here, that this is not just another big problem that we have to face, but it is a large part of the solution uh, for uh, a, a much of yeah. the economic problems of the world and yeah. uh, also of uh, our security. And you asked the qu you all, we all ought to ask the question, with all the benefits of technology, mm -hmm. all of the byproducts that are positive, how is that technology being employed, in a sense, to save the natural earth? Yes. And much of the new technologies that are being developed are, are precisely uh, usable now uh, to uh, turn the, uh, the, the remaining natural environments to uh, greater uh, productivity and security for people. That is, uh, the, uh, the development of new crops, of new fibers. We need a whole new industry of, of tree farming that can draw on the best kinds of uh, tree species that are available in these vanishing forests. And uh, we uh, can uh, turn to these uh, places for medicinal, uh, new, new pharmaceuticals. An extraordinary but also, amount of medicine comes from... Yeah, quite, well, it does. And, and furthermore, uh, studies have shown in Central and South America, for example, that people, local people, can actually make more money harvesting medicinals, natural medicinals from the forest, providing a market uh, mm -hmm. is available to them, than they can by cutting the Trees, forest and right, converting right. agriculture. Well, then why don't they do that? because they don't have the markets developed and they don't have the expert advice. They don't and have the business can, model and they don't have the organizer and they don't have the... Because we've been giving the wrong kind of foreign aid is why. Uh, we've, we haven't been giving them the kind of uh, advice uh, for market development and utilization of their natural resources that they most need. How much of your life is this taking now? This Almost all of it, it I is. suppose. It right really now. is. It, yeah, I mean, it has become a, your obsession. Uh, it's something that I'd like to accomplish in the years that I have left. I, it's, uh, it's, it's worthy of a crusade. I hope to see more and more people uh, involved in it, and not just biologists and conservationists. Mm -hmm. Before this, you and I have had a number of conversations at this table, you yeah. know, and we have talked about beliefs. And, and uh, has, this, has this involvement done anything to change any, any, pro, any sense of the way you viewed uh, man uh, and woman and the whole notion of, of the priority, the, the, um, you know, the, the priority of biology and, and uh, genetics to who we are? No, it hasn't. Uh, they, uh, because I still view, and I think it's increasingly the view of those who are well informed in science uh, and the more advanced of the social sciences, we are very much a biological species. You know, we are a biological species in a biological world. Now, human nature was biologically in, uh, evolved to uh, fit us uh, exquisitely well to the environment that we have, that was, we inherited, you know, the natural environment, physiology and in the mind. What is new is, is not that view, which I think has grown stronger over the years that we've, we've chatted like this. Right. Uh, it's grown stronger, uh, but uh, what, what has changed is just in the last several years, uh, the, uh, the situation about the world fauna and flora, which we knew was, in, was, not, was grim, mm -hmm. uh, has now come into clear focus so that we feel we can do something about it. And furthermore, uh, the new methods of conservation and economic development, uh, tie, these two tied together, uh, have, have emerged, uh, some just within the last several years. This is what gives me a certain amount of guarded optimism, providing uh, we can get it onto the national agenda. How do you think we can do that? Persuasion yeah. uh, and advising and willingness on the part of the biologist and the economist to uh, okay. To advise, I, I, it's, this is not something that's going to be in any sense competitive with or counterproductive to the main aims of this country. But we, I think we, want, we need to make the case, we can make the case, that it's going to be consistent with it, that it's going to reinforce it. Yeah. I've forgotten where you said this, 
but it is the, the horror of waking up at the end when it's too late and yeah. saying, my God, what have we done? Yeah. What is, who said that uh, uh, hell is truth seen too late? <laughs> <laughs> well said. The Future of Life, Edward O. Wilson, Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, I, I'm pleased to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Future of Life, Edward O. Wilson. We'll be right back. Stay with us.